Section 4 of A Dozen Ways of Love A Taint in the Blood Chapter 1 The curate was walking on the cliffs with his lady love. All the sky was grey, all the sea was grey. The soft march wind blew over the rocky shore. It could not rustle the bright green weed that hung wet from the boulders, but it set all the tufts of grass upon the cliffs nodding to the song of the ebbing tide. The lady was the vicar's daughter. Her name was Violetta. Let us stand still here, said the curate, for there is something I must say to you today. So they stood still and looked at the sea. Violetta, said the curate, you cannot be ignorant that I have long loved you. Last night I took courage and told your father of my hope and desire that you should become my wife. He told me what I did not know that you had already tasted the joy of love and the sorrow of its disappointment. I can only ask you now if this former love has made it impossible that you should love again. No, she answered, for although I loved and sorrowed then with all the strength of a child's heart, still it was only as a child and that is past. Will you be my wife? said the curate. I cannot choose but say yes. I love you so much. Then they turned and went back along the cliffs, and the curate was very happy. But tell me, he said, about this other man that loved you. His name was Herbert. He was a squire's son. He loved me, and I loved him. But afterwards we found that his mother had been mad. Yoletta paused and turned her sweet blue eyes upon the sea. So you could not marry? said the curate. No said Violetta, casting her eyes downward, because a taint of madness is a terrible thing. She shuddered and blushed. And you loved him, dearly. Dearly, said Violetta, clasping her hands. But madness in the blood is too terrible. It is like the inheritance of a curse. He went away, said the curate. Yes, Herbert went away, and he died. He loved me so much that he died. I do not wonder at that, said the curate, for you are very lovely, Violetta. They walked home hand in hand, and when they had said goodbye under the beech trees that grew by the vicarage gate, the curate went down the street of the little town. The shopkeepers were at their doors, breathing the mild spring air. The fishermen had hung their nets to dry in the marketplace near the quay. The western cloud was turning crimson, and the steep roofs and the grey church tower absorbed in sombre colours the tender light. The curate was going home to his lodgings, but he bethought him of his tea and turned into the pastor cook's by the way. Have you any muffins, Miss Yander? he asked. No, sir, said the portly wife of the baker in a sad tone. They're all over. Crumpets, said he. Past and gone, sir said the woman with a sigh. She had a coarsely poetical cast of mind, and commonly spoke of the sale of her goods as one might speak of the passing of summer flowers. The curate was turning away. I would make bold, sir, said the woman, to ask if you've heard that we've let our second floor front for a while. It's a great thing for us, sir, as you know, to have it let. Not that you'll approve the person as it took it. Oh, said the curate. How was that? He's the new Jewish rabbi, sir, being as they've opened the place of their heathenish worship again. It's been shut this two year for want of a Hebrew to read the language. Oh no, Miss Yander, you're quite mistaken in calling the Jews heathens. The meeting place is down by the end of the street, sir, a squarish sort of house. It's not been open in your time, likely you'll not know it. The new rabbi's been reading a couple of weeks to them. They do say it's awful queer. Oh, indeed, said the curate. What are their hours of service? Well, to say the truth, sir, they'll soon be at it now, for it's Friday at sunset. They've some antics or other in the place. The rabbi's just gone with his book. I think I'll look them up and see what they're at, said he, going out. He was a thin, hard-working man. His whole soul was possessed by his great love for Violetta, but even the gladness of its success could not turn him from his work. 
When the day was over, he would indulge, brooding on his joy. Until then, the need of the world pressed. He stepped out again into the evening glow. The wind had grown stronger, and he bent his head forward and walked against it toward the west. He felt a sudden sympathy for this stranger who had come to minister in his own way to the few scattered children of the Jews who were in the town. He knew the unjust sentiment with which he would be surrounded as by an atmosphere. The curate was broad in his views. All nations and all people, thought he, lust for an excuse to deem their neighbors less worthy than themselves, that they might oppress him. This is a selfishness which is the cause of all sin and is the devil. When he got to this point in his thoughts, he came to a sudden stand and looked up. But thank God, he said to himself, the true life is still in the world, and as we resist the evil, we not only triumph ourselves, but make the triumph of our children sure. So reasoned the curate. He was a rather fanatical fellow. The people near him gave a good day when they saw him stop. All up and down the street the children played with shrill noises and pattering feet. The sunset cloud was brighter, and the dark peaked roofs of tile and thatch and slate, as if compelled to take some notice of the fire, threw back the red where, here and there, some glint of moisture gave reflection to the colored light. He had come near the end of the town, and, where the houses opened, the red sky was fretted with dark twigs and branches of elm trees that grew on the grassy slope of the cliff. The elm trees were in the squire's park, and the curate looked at them sadly and thought of Herbert, who had died. Up a little lane at the end of the street, he found the entrance to a low square hall. There was a small anteroom to the place of service, and in this, a dull-looking man was seated polishing a candlestick. He was a crossing sweeper by trade and a friend of the curate. Well, Issachar, so you've got your synagogue open again. The man Issachar made some sound meant for a response, but not intelligible. How many Jews will be there in the town? Twenty that are the heads of families and two grown youths, said Issachar. That's enough to keep up a practice, for some of them will be rich. Some are very rich, said Issachar, wrinkling his face with satisfaction when he said the word. Then how is it you don't always keep up the service? But Issachar had no explanation to give. He polished his candlestick the more vigorously and related at some length what he knew of the present reader which was, in fact, nothing, except that he was a foreigner and had only offered to read while he was visiting the town. I have come for the service, said the curate. <laughs> Better not, said Issachar. It's short tonight, and there'll not be many. The curate answered by opening the inner door and entering. There were some high pews up and down the sides of the room. There was a curtain at the farther end and a reading desk in the center both of which were enclosed in a railing ornamented by brass knobs, and in which were set high posts supporting gas lamps, nine in all, which were lit either for heat or ceremony, and turned down to a subdued light. The evening light entered through the dome roof. Hebrew texts, which the curate could not decipher, were painted on the dark walls. He took off his hat reverently and sat down. There was no one there. He felt very much surprised at finding himself alone. To his impressible nervous nature, it seemed that he had suddenly entered a place far removed in time and space from the everyday life with which he was so familiar. He sat a long time. It was cold, and the evening light grew dim. And yet no one came. Issachar entered now and then, and made brief remarks about sundry things as he gave additional polish to the knobs on the railing, but he always went out again. At length, a side door opened, and the reader came in from his vestry. He had apparently waited in hope of a congregation, but now came in to perform his duty without their aid. Perhaps he was not so much disappointed as the curate was. It would have been very difficult to tell from looking at him what his emotions were. He was a large, stout man with a coarse brown beard. There was little to be seen of his face but the hair upon it, and one gathered the suggestion, although it was hard to know from what, that the man and his beard were not as clean as might be. He wore a black gown and an ordinary high silk hat, although pushed much further back on his head than an Englishman would have worn it. He walked heavily and clumsily inside the railing and stood before the desk, slowly turning over backward the leaves of the great book. Then, suddenly, he began to chant in the Hebrew tongue. 
His voice fell mellow and sweet upon the silence, filling it with a drowsy sound, as the soft music of a humble bee might suddenly fill the silence of a woodland glade. There was no thought, only feeling, conveyed by the sound. Issachar had gone out, and the Anglican priest sat erect, gazing at the Jew through the fading light, his attention painfully strained by the sense of loneliness and surprise. From mere habit, he supposed the chant to be an introduction to a very service, but no change came. On and on and on went the strange music like a potent incantation, the big Jew swaying his body slightly with the rhythm, and at long intervals came the whisper of paper with the turning of the leaf. The curate gazed and wondered until he forgot himself. Then he tried with an effort to recall who he was and where he was and all the details of the busy field of labor he had left just outside the door. He wished that the walls of the square room were not so thick, that some sound from the town might come in and mingle with the chant. He strained his ear in vain to catch a word of the Hebrew which might be intelligible to him. He wondered much what sort of man this Jew might be, actuated by what motives, impelled by what impulses to his lonely task. All the sorrow of a hope deferred through ages, and a long torture patiently borne seemed gathered in the candence. But the man, surely the man was no refined embodiment of the highest sentiment of the psalm. And still, the soft rich voice chanted the unknown language, and the daylight grew more dim. The curate was conscious that, again, he tried to remember who he was, and where. And then the surroundings of the humble synagogue fell away, and he himself was standing looking at a jewel. It was a purple stone, oval-shaped and polished, perhaps about as large as a drop of dew which would hang in a harebell's heart. The stone was the color of a harebell, and there was a ray of light in it, as if in the process of its formation the jewel had caught sight of a star and imprisoned the tiny reflection forever within itself. The curate moved his head from side to side to see if the ray within the stone would remain still, but it did not, turning itself to meet his eyes as if the tiny star had a life and a light of its own. Then he looked at the setting, for the stone was set in steel, a zigzag barred steel frame held it fast, and outside the zigzag bars there was a smooth ring, with some words cut upon it in Hebrew. The characters were very small. He knew, rather than saw, that they were Hebrew, but he did not know what they meant. All this time he had been stooping down, looking at this thing as if it lay very near the ground. Then, suddenly he noticed upon what it was lying. There was a steel chain fastened to it, and the chain was around the neck of a woman who lay upon the earth. The jewel was upon her breast, but how white and cold the breast was. Surely there was no life in it, and he observed with horror that the garments which had fallen back were oozing with water, and that the hair was wet. He hardly saw the face, for a moment he thought he saw it, and that it was the face of a Jewess, young and beautiful, but the vision passed from him. The chant had ceased, and the rabbi was kissing his book. Very solemnly the Jew bowed himself three times and kissed the book. And then, in the twilight of the nine dim lamps, he stumbled out and shut the door, without giving a glance to his one listener. As for the young Christian priest, he was panic-stricken. When our senses themselves deceive us, we are cut off from our cheerful belief in the reality of material things, or forced to face the unpleasant fact that we hold no stable relationship to them. He rushed out into the street. Issachar was at the entrance as he passed and he fancied he saw the face of the reader peeping at him from the vestry window. But he crushed his hat hard down on his head and strode away, courting the bluster of the wind, striving by the energy of action to cast off the trance that seemed to enslave him. When he reached his own door, he found the baker's wife sitting on the doorstep. It was quite dusk. Perhaps that was the reason he did not recognize her at first. Ah, oh, sir, I found them two muffins lying unbeknown in the corner of the shelf. So I brought them round, thinking you mightn't have had your tea. Muffins, said the curate, as if he were not quite sure what muffins might be. Then he began to wonder if he really was losing his wits, and he plunged into a talk with the woman, saying anything and everything to convince himself that he was not asleep or mad. Do you know, Mrs. Yender, that I am going to be married? Well, I am sure, sir, said she, curtsying and smiling. It's a great compliment to me to hear it from your own lips. Not that it's unexpected. 
Miss Violetta's a sweet saint, just like her ma she is, and her ma's a saint if there ever was one. Mr. Hicks, the verger, says that to see her pray that length of time on her knees after the service is over in church is a touching sight. But I don't think Miss Violetta is like her mother, said the curate. Well, no, sir, now that you mention it, perhaps she's not, at least not in looks. But, lor, sir, she's wonderful like her ma when it comes to paying a bill. Not but what they're to be respected for keeping an eye on the purse. I often tell Yender that if we were a bit more saving, just like the vicar's lady, we'd lay by a bit for our old age. Yes, Mrs. Yender, yes. That would be an excellent plan, said the curate, fumbling with his latch key in the door. Suppose you come in and make my tea for me, Miss Yender. I'm all alone tonight. I bethought I might do that, sir, when I came along. Yander was in the shop, and I said, Mrs. Jones, having gone to see her son, that you'd have no one. So, I just say to Yander, I'll step round, and if I'm asked to make tea... The curate lit his lamp and poked his fire, and the portly woman began to toast his muffins. The flame lit up the placid wrinkles on her face, and she knelt before it. But I don't think Miss Violetta is in the least like her mother, said he again. Hello, sir, don't you? Well... You ought to know best. They do say what's bred in the bone comes out in the flesh, but I'll be none the worse for you if she looks sharp after the spending. You're not much given to saving. The curate walked nervously up and down his small room. Make the tea strong tonight, he said. Mr. Higgs, the verger, do hate the vicar's lady, sir. He do, and make no mistake. But he says anybody could see with half an eye that she was a real saint. The subscriptions she puts down to missions and church restorings, it's quite wonderful. The curate ran his hand wearily through his hair. He felt called upon to say something. I have the highest respect for Mrs. Moore, he began. I know her to be a most devoted helpmeet to the vicar and a truly good woman. At the same time, he coughed, at <coughs> the same time, I should wish to say distinctly that after being niggardly in her own domestic affairs, which is unfortunately the case. I do not think that it adds to her stock of Christian virtues to give the money thus saved to church work. The curate cleared his throat. It was because he was flying from himself that he had let the woman talk until this speech of his had been made necessary. But at all times his humble friends in this town were well nigh irrepressive in their talk. This woman was in full tide now. They do say, sir, there is a difference between honest saving and greed. Mr. Higgs sent to Yender one day, says he, Mrs. Moore's folks far back made their money by sharp trading and greeds in the family, and it's a worse sort of greed, for it grasps both at heaven and earth, both at this life and the heavenly, and, says he, no one could doubt that the ladies that way constituted that she couldn't cut a loaf of bread in half without giving herself the largest share, even if it were the bread of life. My good Mrs. Yender, began the curate in stern rebuke. Oh no, sir, Mr. Higgs don't mean no harm. He only gets that riled at Mrs. Moore sometimes that he kind of lets off to Yender and me. And I don't think, Mrs. Yender, said the curate for the third time, that Miss Violetta is at all like her mother. She's young yet, sir, said the woman. Then she went away, leaving the curate to interpret her last remark as he chose. End of section four.